Welcome to The Ripple Effect, Healing Men, Transforming Communities. My name is Jordan Angelo, and I'm the creative director here at Men Healing. Um, and also, I will be your host for this evening's event. We're so grateful that you're all here to join us tonight to celebrate the impact that we're all making together. So tonight's theme is The Ripple Effect. So just a single drop of water creates ripples, and each of you folks plays a vital role in that healing journey for all survivors. So our goal tonight is to raise awareness, share stories, and honor those who help build this movement, as well as show support for Men Healing, the organization. So I wanted to begin tonight by remembering two pioneers who helped shape Men Healing and are a huge part of this movement, Joanna Colrain and Peter Dimmick. Their contributions have left an enduring legacy. So please join me in honoring these two healing heroes. Peter and Joanna were such inspirational ancestors. They helped to forge a path that has led us to be here today. Welcome to everyone who has joined this gathering. Each of us are now becoming the ancestors for the next generation. I think most of you already know me. My name is Jim Struve, Executive Director of Men Healing. The theme for today is ripple effect. We affirm that each of us has significance in building a movement to help men and their loved ones heal from sexual harm. By supporting men to heal, we hope to help heal the world. Watching the memorial video nurtures my commitment to the longevity of movement building and reinforces my belief that every action matters in support of our mission. My own path to working with boys and men who experience sexual harm reflects the synchronicity of ripple effect. Quite by accident, beginning in 1976, I landed a series of jobs within child welfare agencies that immersed me in the lives of boys who had experienced sexual harm. Without any professional training, I was puzzled by my ease and effectiveness in relating to these boys. Then, one day, I was unexpectedly startled by a flood of repressed memories that revealed my own childhood history which had been dominated by sexual harm. I was forced to face the difficult but liberating truth that I myself was also a survivor. My search to heal myself revealed the absence of resources for adult men who had experienced sexual harm. That day I made a commitment that would have unexpected ripple effects for my life and the lives of other boys and men like me. I decided that I would not tolerate a world in which there were no resources for boys and men. If there were no resources available, I would damn well find a way to create them. Luckily, I was not alone. 
I had the good fortune to meet other soul companions like Peter and Joanna, who shared my passion. Together in the late 1980s, we supported each other by crafting the first two conferences in the world to focus attention on the experiences of non-offending male survivors of sexual harm. We now honor the legacy of the many pioneers and ancestors by holding their DNA dearly in the heart and soul of men healing. We're one of the only organizations in the nation to offer a variety of programs and services for men survivors and their loved ones. Most importantly, we foster heart connection and community for men and their loved ones to be seen and to heal together. Personally, I am proud that I've sustained my commitment for almost 50 years by helping men and their loved ones to heal. I embrace humility that I'm only a single drop of water in a more expansive movement for change. As I reflect on the concept of ripple effect, I am reminded of a teaching I learned many years ago from Thich Nhat Hanh, a wise Buddhist mentor. Sunshine and clouds inhabit the sky. Clouds are containers for drops of water. One by one, drops of water travel from clouds to earth as rain. Sometimes individual water droplets land in close proximity to each other, thereby forming a pond. As a pond grows, drops of water become a moving stream and the ripple effect begins. Streams begin their search for pathways to join together as rivers. Rivers have diversity of movement, ever-changing waterscapes of lakes and rapids, offering calm reflection and forceful movement, shaping and reshaping Earth's terrain. Rivers are determination in motion. And most rivers eventually find a path to the ocean. Oceans are vast expanses of water, magnificent in their beauty and power influencing all aspects of life on planet Earth. However, upon reflection, an ocean is merely a huge collection of individual drops of water that have each found their way to a shared space that forms an ocean. Over time, and honoring the cycles of life, many drops of water become ancestors as they ascend back to the clouds, forming new generations of water droplets, many of which will repeat the journey to Earth and back to the ocean. This story illustrates the possibilities of the ripple effect. Current data exposes the reality that one of every six boys or men will experience sexual harm during childhood or as adults. That currently calculates to at least 28 million American men as survivors of sexual harm. Each of us here today has, signific has significance as an individual drop of water. Men healing is a living organism that thrives as a community of individual drops of water. By evolving together, we have grown beyond the pond and have become a river. We are building a movement that has the capacity to change the world. I invite each of you to join us on our journey toward a magnificent ocean that has capacity to provide the resources to heal every man and loved one who has been impacted by sexual harm. We are more than individual drops of water when we embrace the ripple effect of our collaborative relationships. Thanks for your presence here today. Much gratitude for whatever ways you can participate in and contribute to our movement for inspiring hope and changing lives. So as the event team was putting this event together, um, we were trying to think of some impactful pieces we could gather. And we came across, thanks to Sam, Dexter Spitz. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce the first performance of the night, um, a spoken artist called Dexter Spitz. He's the founder of a movement called How Men Cry, and the movement really cha challenges societal views on men's vulnerability and emotional expression and masculinity. And here at Men Healing, we really love to embody the power of storytelling which Dexter embodies himself. Greetings all, I am very excited to be here for this Men Healing event. I go by the name of Dexter Spitz, the founder of How Men Cry. 
How Men Cry is an organization that I founded after going through my own process of therapy and healing. And we aim at destigmatizing conversations around mental health and changing the narrative around men's mental health as a whole. Today, I'll be sharing a piece with you called Water. Water is a poem that talks about all the different pressures that we can take on in life that can get us to a point of feeling like drowning. I think of us all as standing in our own individual swimming pools and all the different bubbles and water droplets are different inputs that can be weighing on us within our lives. It doesn't necessarily mean that all of these inputs are bad, negative, maybe some are positive, but it's still input and information that we're taking on continuously. And the tricky thing about the swimming pools that we're standing in is you don't know how well someone is swimming in your life. Maybe someone is floating along and doing just fine. They're treading water comfortably, but there can be other times, right, where maybe we are struggling to stay afloat or never really learn the best ways to swim and or in the worst case scenarios can be drowning right there in plain sight. I hope that this piece helps to articulate ways that we can evaluate the inputs that we have that are weighing on us and also maybe talk more comfortably about that internal experience when we are maybe struggling to swim. I learned how to swim when I was 26 years old. I don't know if y'all know, but there's a stereotype that American black folk can't swim. We didn't really have the best introduction to crossing waters, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I get it. But I try to take the Will Smith approach in life though, no, not the whole slapping people thing, but the taking on of a mentality of challenging things that really scare me. I was a bit embarrassed, but I was determined, so I signed myself up for an introductory swim class, and no, I was not with the little kids, with the floaties, I was with the adults. My father could swim quite well, actually, but he never really took the time to teach me a couple of passing lessons, but he never really made sure I could, so unfortunately, like many things in life, I had to learn how to do so by myself. Sometimes I get tired of swimming alone. So here I go. I learned how to dive into the deep end first. They make it like a rite of passage. I was trying to pretend like I was not afraid, but I can see in this moment that I was this scared little boy all over again, heart racing and nervous, saying the mantra that they teach you, the water is your friend. So I'm starting to panic. So I look around for any means of safety and I see a life raft on the wall. So I'm like, well, at least they can throw that in to save me if this really goes south. So I squeeze my nose and I close my eyes and I jump in. I'm actually a pretty good swimmer nowadays, but every once in a while when standing at the bottom of the pool, I swear that I can feel the pressure of the droplets weighing down on me, seemingly trying to steal the oxygen from my lungs. See, I struggle with treading and I'm not all that great at floating and I know it deep down. So in the worst case scenario, I panic and have to push my way back to the surface. I tend to swim alone. It occurred to me that there will be no one that can throw in a life raft. I should probably be more responsible, but it feels a bit embarrassing to ask for a pool buddy when you're grown. My boy Darren drowned at 22, actually. When I was in my worst bouts of depression, I dreamt of water a lot, saying the mantra that they teach you, the water is your friend, but it doesn't always feel like it. See, sometimes when standing at the bottom of the pool, I swear that I can feel the pressure of the droplets weighing down on me, seemingly stealing the oxygen from my lungs, kind of like how it feels to be a man sometimes when I really start to sit back and think about all the pressures that I've taken on in the world about who I should be according to others just for fitting in the man category. It starts to feel like pressure from all sides being told in one moment that it's okay to ask for help and being told in the next that I need to work my way out of this trauma while being scolded for my shortcomings and I know that I am responsible for me I'm responsible for the harm that I've caused but I'm also responsible to work my way out of this trauma and teach myself how to swim and what I'm saying is it feels like a lot of water and I'm tired of swimming alone so when I tell you no baby I'm tired when I say no man I'm good when I say baby I don't want to talk about it today what I'm really telling you is that I am drowning when I was in my worst bouts of depression I dreamt of water a lot saying the mantra that they teach you, the water is your friend, but it doesn't always feel like it. I started dreaming about just jumping into the water and not trying to win the fight for the oxygen at all. See, there's an eerie silence under the water. 
the pressure of the droplets don't make a sound, but how is it that they've been so loud? They've been so loud for so long. He bullies you. You fight back. You need to know how to be tough. Crush the competition in business. No quit attitude. You need to work a good job. Your self-worth is your net worth. Strengthen your network. Work out, bro. Get your gains. Build generational wealth. Oh, black man, be a pillar for your community. Be yourself, but actually be the version that we all want you to be. Show up. You're so toxic. Heal yourself. Get girls with your 401k looking like. Ask for help, but not too much. Because then you're too soft, you're too soft, you're too hard Why are you so angry? Why are you being short with me? You're an asshole, men are assholes Be gentle, love me back, just wait, hold on It's too much water, it's too much water It's too much water, and I know that I'm responsible For me, I'm responsible for the harm that I've caused But I'm also responsible to work my way Out of this trauma and teach myself How to swim, and what I'm saying is it feels like a lot of water And I'm tired of swimming alone So when I tell you, no baby, I'm tired When I say, no man, I'm good When I say, baby, I don't want to talk about it When I say, please, just hold on, please just love me through this I know I need to be better. I know I need to be better. I am trying. What I'm really telling you is that I am drowning. And sometimes I just need a life raft. That was incredible. The power of words there on full display. Thanks, Dexter Spitz. You can, uh, folks, feel free to comment on any of this stuff in the, in the chat. We really want to encourage your own reactions and your own feelings about what's happening tonight. Our next guest is a longtime supporter of Men Healing and a Weekend of Recovery alumnus. Um, I had the honor of attending a Weekend of Recovery uh, with Andrew a few years ago, um, and he's quite, quite the person. His journey is a testament to the strength of survivors and the impact this movement can have. Tonight, he'll be sharing an excerpt from his first novel, which speaks deeply to the healing work that we're all doing here. Please join me in welcoming Andrew Vineyard. Hi, I'm Andrew Vineyard. I'm an alumnus of The Weekends of Recovery, and I've also been working on a novel for the last few years. And I've been part of Men Healing for 11 years. And it was from the very beginning life-changing. In fact, the first time I ever acknowledged I'd been sexually abused. I grew up in a small town in Georgia called Lithia Springs. And for me, I really, you know, dealt with this identity of, you know, having been sexually abused by my father and the certain just realities of views that I'm expected to have as a, as a white male southerner, knowing what was done to me was wrong, but not being able to express it. Um, I think the culture I was raised in was very much like, um, grin and bear it. And this is part of being a man is you don't complain about it. You don't let this stuff out. And actually, when I did the story project, there were several people from my um, town in Georgia who posted some pretty nasty comments about me letting dirty laundry out and talking about my father that way and telling what, what he had done. And it really was this whole system of keeping people silent and just going along so that's what got me to write is, is to try and I'm trying not to get emotional, but to have some empathy for, you know, that little boy and to really show what it was like for me growing up. Um, I've not tried to say this is wrong or right. I just tried to give an accurate depiction, uh, of what it was like. I didn't even really know what genre I was writing in until about a third of the way in. I realized I'm writing a Southern Gothic detective novel. The excerpt that I'm reading is from Wayland's point of view. He's a GBI agent, Georgia Bureau of Investigation agent, who's been called in on a child's murder, um, and that's been getting a lot of attention. And even Wayland has a history of sexual abuse. He's from rural Georgia also. Um, and so even there, there's a lot of overlap. So many survivors, myself included, struggle just being in their bodies. I'm not an expert in this, but I, I do know that survivors have a much higher rate of autoimmune diseases, much higher rate of having body dysmorphia. You know, it's just, it affects you in such a core way that it's really even hard to know yourself, including your own body. Um, and I have thought a lot about that. And in that writing, I'm trying to show what it's like to be so separate from yourself, um, to be split in two at such a young age and to carry that around. I think survivors. I hope that they feel that this is authentic to the experience of dissociation in terms of the allies and friends and family, things like that. 
I hope it helps give them some of an understanding. I hope it helps build connections. You know, I think something I've, I've really loved about the friends I have, my partner, and I'm just so grateful for their willingness to try and understand me and to not write off whatever I'm experiencing, even if they don't fully get it. I did not expect to make it this far in my novel. And here I am at the very, very end of reworking it. I don't think I would have had the courage or support to write this about men healing. And there's been just so many people from that community I built that have supported me in doing this. They've totally said like, go for it. And what do you have to lose? It's really helped me, um, allow myself to just hear that, that I have a right to follow things that feel meaningful to me. It doesn't, you know, have to have some sort of outcome. This may not have any benefits financially. I may never get anything out of it. It may never even get published, but it means everything to me and I really need to do it. 2 AM Tuesday, March 3rd, 1999. Wayland sat on the edge of the bed crunched forward with his chin resting on his closed fist. He had a 10 a.m. appointment with Frank. He just had to hold on a little longer. His sucking, pleading sobs repeated in his mind. This thing had visited him before, but he'd never understood it. Questions swam in and out of his mind. He'd given up on sleep hours ago. Instead, he practiced connecting the rooms and shutting the doors. Yet his mind refused to go long. He stepped back to long ago, to the first time his memories had come back to him. In 1975, Wayland reclined on the sofa of his mother's small apartment. He was on leave with only six months left in his service. The news reported on the crash of a U.S. cargo plane in a rice paddy in Vietnam. Thousands of American uh, orphans, known as Asians, U.S. citizens by law, were being flown to the United States by Operation Baby Lift. The TV flashed images of the smoking plane and the farmers pulling bodies out of the wreckage before switching to black and white photos of infants in square plastic containers laid side by side in airplane seats, children of GIs and Vietnamese women who wouldn't claim them. Something about the randomness of it, the small choice of putting a child on a plane being consequential, triggered it. He only glimpsed it, like, through, like looking through the triangle of light from a cracked door. The light started to move arching in tune with footsteps on bare wood. It hooked him, pulled him out of his body. He could feel his father's hands rough against his flesh, his hot breath on his face. The sourness of it filled his nostrils. The last scent before the world went upside down. Wayland found himself separated in two halves. Part of him was there sitting on the couch, while another part of him stuck to the ceiling, looking down at the cramped living room. The world looked like an invitation. Everything had been copied and replaced. His mother came into the room. Her hair, covered by a sleeping cap, gave her a sterile, surgical appearance, and the blue bathrobe made her look like a plump fairy. Jojo? His childhood nickname floated through the room, but didn't reach him. He couldn't respond. It was like a wire ran from his body to the ceiling, and the signals were too faint to make it down. His mother reached out, placed her soft hand on his cheek. Her touch saved him, allowed him to crawl down into himself. In the dark room, Wayland took long, deep breaths. The cold sweat ran down his cheeks. His mother had died years ago, but he still craved her soothing touch, the grounding of her love. Sitting at the edge of the bed with his bare feet on the thin carpet, he listened to the distant wash of an airliner. And the far off mechanical roar, a word came through, Terrence. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you all enjoyed that. And um, I hope to get this out soon and have a, a community of people reading it. Thanks, Andrew. I'm going to invite everybody to just take a deep breath right now. Y'all just want to close your eyes or do whatever is comfortable for you. And just breathe in. No. Again, thank you, Andrew. Thank everyone for being here. I know some of this stuff can be heavy, but like Andrew said, you know, we're just depicting things accurately while also celebrating all the healing that that we can enjoy as well. I want to introduce our next speaker, uh, Rob Valentine. He's also a longtime supporter and valued member of this healing movement. He's someone who has fully embraced the ripple effect, in my opinion, in his own life. His story really reflects how healing can change lives and create ripples that spread throughout families and communities and beyond. 
So Rob, thank you for being here and thank you for sharing a little piece of your journey with us tonight. Thank you, Jordan, and thank you all for being here this evening. I would like to start tonight with telling you a story about someone that I know very well. For most of his life, he didn't want anyone to know that he was struggling on the inside with mental health challenges. He had promised himself that he would never tell anyone about the pain that he endured. As he began to heal, he found the courage to acknowledge some of the trauma and the hardships that he had experienced growing up from childhood sexual abuse, along with emotional and physical abuse, growing up in a family with alcohol addiction and domestic violence, extreme bullying in school and at home, reoccurring thoughts of suicide, ultimately being diagnosed with PTSD, OCD, and general anxiety disorder, and the list goes on. The reason that I know so much about him is because it's my story. It's me. I thought I would never tell anyone my story. My hope is that by sharing my, a part of my story, it will allow others to know it's okay to ask for help. Sometimes stories are hard to tell, and sometimes stories are hard to hear, but there is incredible power in all of our stories. As I consider the theme of tonight's event, the ripple effect healing men and transforming communities, three significant waves of impact came to my mind. The first one being awakening my truth. You know, recognizing and acknowledging my childhood sexual trauma marked the initial ripple in my healing journey. It was a pivotal moment when I faced my past and I broke out of this huge dark cloud that just surrounded every part of me. As I processed this enormous pain, and I mean pain that I thought would eventually kill me, I discovered this internal strength that said, you don't have to do this alone. I began removing the mask that I wore one by one by one by one. I learned and I continued to learn that I can put words, feelings, emotions, and new meanings to escape the pain, the fear, the anxiety, and the hopelessness. I've come to understand as a survivor that I'm not alone and that many of us as survivors struggle with shame and stigma. Many of us feel that shame about our experiences and fear of being judged or not believed. Not that I made a mistake, but I must be a mistake. Um, not that I did something bad, but I am bad. That is shame that can be overwhelming. Isolation, many survivors may feel alone in our experiences, believing that few people will ever relate to our pain, which can lead to depression and loneliness. Or this fear of disclosure, um, where many times we have a huge concern about revealing our trauma to family, friends, or even professionals. We might worry about how others will react or about how it might impact our relationships. This tells me a little bit, that tells you a little bit about my first ripple, awakening to my truth. Now let me tell you a little bit about the second ripple, pathways to healing, or what I like to say is Human connection drives wellness. My journey through hope and recovery illustrates that healing is not linear. And by sharing what worked for me, I hope to motivate others to take their own steps forward. The resources and pathways to my healing include and have included early in the 90s, attending adult children of alcoholics meetings and gaining an understanding of the impact of growing up in a family with alcohol addiction and some other programs that have embed the 12 steps into a pathway to healing from the problem to the solution. Fortunately, my company had an employee assistance program or EAP that I went to in the early 90s that started this journey. Of course, I didn't talk about any of the abuse stuff. I then went to individual therapy several times and have to tell you that a couple of them weren't very helpful. Um, a couple of them, as I started sharing about my journey, began to weep and cry, obviously not doing any of their own work at the time. But I knew and I had a friend who said, don't give up, find someone that focuses on trauma. I then found an incredible therapist, a, a, therapist, a trauma therapist who has practiced EMDR therapy. I remember the day that I decided to trust this person with my pain, all of it, and she reflected back how strong I really am. 
I'd like to also talk a little bit about weekends of recovery and, and read you something. You'll see on the right, you'll see a, a beautiful bridge and you'll see the building of where we met and you'll see the, the table of where we had meals together. But what I wrote after I came back from the weekend is I said, I can't thank all of you enough for the life-changing weekend. I learned so much about myself. In each of you, I saw myself. I saw my pain. I saw my anger. I saw my strength. I saw my courage. I saw my resolve to not let my abusers win. Monday was a tough day for me as well. Lots of emotion, and I wasn't sure I could push it back down. I needed to do that since I was at work that day. I really hope that we can stay connected. You guys inspired me beyond words. I also learned how important it was to do group type, other types of group activities. And in this weekend of recovery, we did group exercises. We did guided meditations. We participated in small groups. We played, we had fun, we cried, and we learned how to heal through connection and speaking our truth. There was a life-changing space that allowed me and others to look at each other in the eye and talk about not what happened, but what was done to us. I learned that my brain was connected to my body and how I stored up a lot of trauma in my brain that needed to be dealt with. We practiced asking for the support that we needed. We experienced a sense of community, brotherhood, and joy. I've learned that the weekend of recovery and other men healing events has taught me real connection and real relationships. I met during that weekend three very brave men um, that we continue to meet on a regular basis, and we have now met together as a group for more than 12 years. In the past two years, I have also been participating in the Men Healing Survivor online support groups. Um, a couple of the men are here tonight. Hello and welcome. And I can tell you that in my most recent group, seven very brave men, all from different walks of life, we all realized that we belong to a club that none of us ever wanted to be a part of, but we are all grateful as we pull strength from each other's journeys. And now I move to the third part of the ripple effect for me, which is connecting through stories, changing and saving lives. By being open about my experiences, I aim to validate the struggles of others and to inspire hope. My favorite phrase in the last two years is, I will continue to recover out loud so that others don't have to struggle in silence. I knew that my purpose was to take hope in recovery to as many people as possible. You see up on the screen here a couple different examples of where my story was highlighted. And again, I go back to the early ripple of saying I would never tell anybody my story. But I knew, I knew how important it has become to be an advocate and realize that this was done to me. I, I don't like the phrase, this happened. It is something that was done to me and I heal each and every time. And so you'll see that I ran a, a campaign for uh, a fundraising campaign locally. I was highlighted in United Way and I don't share these um, to pat myself on the back, but to let others know that it's okay to start telling your story when you're ready. Again, mine started in a therapist office and from there has spread over the last 15 years. This is a, a couple pictures and yes, I am the guy up in the top left corner um, as a college student. And I can tell you, you see the smile on that face. I was struggling more then than I've struggled most of my life. And yet on the right, you see that in 2018, after years of healing, I became the commencement speaker at a university. How can that even happen? How can I go from feeling this angst to being where I'm sharing hope with others, hope of recovery, the hope of healing? You also see this photo, which is in 2018. I decided that I had hid inside corporate America for 28 years and did not tell people about my mental health journey. I didn't tell them about the weekends of recovery. I didn't tell them about driving to Detroit to go to a support group. I didn't tell them that I was leaving to go to therapy. I said I had a doctor's appointment. But what I can tell you is in 2018, I decided that it was time to again start further telling the story. And I told this story to 500 of my colleagues and I had 75 people in line for three and a half hours wanting to thank me for talking about trauma, talking about recovery and the power of what happens when we heal. 
And finally, today, I have an incredible opportunity of teaching a mental health first aid class to corporations all over the United States. And in each, every one of these, I talk about suicidal ideation. I talk about trauma. I talk about recovery. And whether it's at Ford or Walmart or Delta Airlines, is there are people out in our workplaces that are struggling with trauma, both big T and little t. And I know through telling my story, I can be of help to others. So I once heard someone say that when we spend time with our secrets, we are lonely because our mind and our heart are full of the secrets. But when we let those secrets out and we begin to heal, there is more room for love, more room for joy, and more room for peace. The resources and support that I have found at Men Healing has been transformative in my healing journey, creating ripples of positive change in every aspect of my life as an employee, as a business owner, as a husband, as a grandfather, as a father, as a brother, and as a friend. And I recently celebrated 40 years of marriage that continues to get better each and every day, even after those hard times. I know now that healing is not just possible, but it is a vibrant reality. I also know how to reach out to others when life becomes difficult. So today I experience more peace, more joy, and some incredible relationships in every aspect of my life. Thanks for listening to my story. I'm so both proud of you and I'm just, it's, it's a joy to, to been a part of that journey for the last few years myself. So thank you so much, Rob. Thank you for being here. Men Healing, we, we've, as an organization, we have gone through a bit of an evolution since since I've been a part of it. We're always evolving. You know, we always we always got something new to learn. But during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw a sort of an over, overwhelming increase in the need for support within the survivor community. The men healing responded by expanding our services in ways that we hadn't really anticipated. We quickly adapted and moving our weekends of recovery into a virtual format, proving that healing can happen anywhere. And as the world changed, we recognized that we needed to evolve with it. So our mission became more clear that making healing more accessible and reaching more survivors and removing as many barriers as possible to that healing. After seeing the success of those, some of those virtual events that we held during the pandemic, we knew we had to continue down that path and the evolution led to the creation of our alumni support groups. And these provided a, an online safe space for survivors to continue their work that they were doing in the weekends of recovery, beyond the weekends of recovery. Something that's truly groundbreaking and I think very unique are partner support groups. And these are designed to serve and support partners of survivors. So the ripple effect of these groups is, are, is undeniable. They've become a lifeline for a lot of uh, folks in times when they really, really need them. I would now love to introduce Malia, um, an incredible supporter of men healing and a firm believer in the idea that healing from sexual trauma does extend far beyond the individual. Um, Malia will share more about our unique partner support groups. Hi, my name is Malia Silverman. I have been involved with men healing now for about two years, ever since I joined for a partner weekend of recovery in 2022. And since then, I have uh, attended a couple of retreats as well as being a facilitator of the partner support groups. Two years ago, I was brought, uh, not very happily, I must admit, by my partner to a weekend of recovery. I thought, this space is not for me. This is absolutely your thing. I was really nervous about what it, I would have to talk about and how this, his e healing impacted me. But after three days in the mountains, I very quickly learned how my partner's trauma does impact me and our relationship. And so after the weekend of recovery, our group of uh, partners that were at this retreat did stay in close contact and formed an informal support group. And this was never something I expected to be a part of, being that I would consider myself someone who has always been a bit emotionally closed off. I can't put into words how hugely I benefited from these groups and the people in them. So this partner group, as well as the official partner support groups offered through Men Healing are truly a one of a kind experience for partners. This is something to note that's extremely rare. There are very little to no resources for partners of survivors of sexual abuse to rely on. 
These partner groups are offered as a place of solidarity and understanding. It does allow for partners to gather once or twice a month, depending on the schedule, to connect about the topics that have been coming up or may have been difficult in the past weeks since they last spoke. Sometimes there are arranged topics through facilitators as well. Sometimes the conversation just takes off based on the needs of the group. This space has allowed me to build connections and relationships with other partners that I can call on a good day to celebrate a success or a bad day to talk through difficulties that may be coming up for us. When one person is hurting, everybody else around them is noticing that hurting or hurting themselves. And our world, I like to think, is based on a whole lot of kindness, support, and love out there. And the ripple effect really supports the healing from one person and how we see that ripple outward to the healing of others in their community. I've been able to share my personal experience with a couple of friends and family who recognize how um, impactful this has been, and then they've passed it on to their partners or their friends. And they've mentioned how amazing it is for partners to have this space and how a lot of times even someone they know could benefit from joining a space like this. So I'd say that right there is the ripple effect in the works. For men healing to hold space for partners is really to hold space for healing across the board. And this is an outlet dedicated entirely to what is coming up for the partner of the survivor. So I just wanna thank men healing for holding this space for partners because it's truly one of a kind. So our next guest, Kaziah Waters, is a truly gifted theater and performance artist who brings their own journey of survival and healing into their work. Tonight, they will be sharing a powerful performance that addresses generational trauma and tracing and healing. And, you know, just as, as healing can have a ripple effect, trauma can truly have a ripple effect as well. So we need to counteract that. And part of Kaziah's performance talks about that. It's weird and wonderful, and I hope you all enjoy it. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Kasaya. I am so grateful to be asked to present a piece for our man healing, um, this beautiful organization with a mission um, about you know a, a mission that's close to me, especially as a survivor of sexual trauma. Um, is somebody who is constantly in the process of healing. Um, and the cyclical process. One thing, one technique um, that um, I'm in the practice of when I think about healing is tracing. Um, tracing where things live on my body, the performance, my social conditioning, uh, how my, how the words come out of my mouth, how I walk, how I enter the room, how I receive information, all of that is connected and all of that is connected not just through me but through a generational um uh, lens um a song that kept on coming up as i was creating this project um a song that was coming up was them bones and the bones a lot of my work deals with around folklore rituals and historical archives um them bones is a spiritual that we know contemporarily as uh uh as a nursery song. So them bones, them bones, and the dry bones, knee bone connected to the leg bone, the leg bone connected to the pelvic bone. Um, and what it's doing is not only locating where things live inside of the body, but breaking things off into tiny pieces so you can understand the whole. And that's kind of like how I think about healing and I think about um, what I wanted to talk about in my own healing process of how um, instead of them bones, but them people, them people are um, that event, that event connected to this event makes this event, right? It's, 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 if map, it's a little bit of mathematics in there. Uh, this ad is subtracting, dividing, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very much, uh, how, I, how people think of, um, chromosomes, right? Um, but different behavior kind of passes down and gets subtracted and get added as, and I, I've been noticing what things live on my body that also lives in my father's body and my grandfather's body, what things that lived in their body no longer lives in my body and what I had to do s to subtract some of those things. Um, the blessings, the curses, the blessings, the curses, the blessings, and the curses. Uh, this piece is called Them Bones because it's about tracing, finding, catching, masculinity, 
in order to be a productive member in society and, and, and the community that I want to love and that loves me. Wow. Um, so here's them bones. Thank you to Kazaya. Like I said, weird and wonderful. So tonight we are trying to raise money for men healing. We're trying to get to 50,000. And thanks to generous donor support, we do have a pool of 20,000 in donations. Just to let you folks know that we are, men healing is entirely powered by individuals like you, people who care about this issue and about this movement and who want to be a part of it. We don't receive any 
government grants or big foundation grants. And a lot of that is due to because we, you know, healing looks different uh, for everybody. And we cannot have the strings attached to a lot of the, that money. And so we are entirely powered by by you guys. And that's important for us. So at any point tonight, please make a donation if you can to support Men Healing's programs <clears throat> and to help them and all their, uh, all their loved ones and help us get to that 50,000. Before we move on, I want to thank you, Kaziah, again. And like I just said, at Men Healing, we do truly believe that healing comes in so many different shapes, ways, and forms, and that not one size fits all. That's not an approach that you can take when it comes to healing from, from sexual trauma. And that's why we created the Just Healing podcast. So it was an effort to continue this movement of accessibility and healing to help break that stigma around trauma. And our podcast, Just Healing, doesn't exclusively revolve around male trauma or male sexual trauma, in fact. Um, it is just what the title implies. It's just healing and all the different weird, wonderful um, ways that we do that. So it dives into just honest discussions and personal narratives and celebrates all the different kinds of ways that we can heal. So I just want to show you all this very brief sort of highlight reel of Just Healing. It is available on all podcast platforms. And we also have, if you go to the Men Healing YouTube page, you can watch the, the episodes as well in a video format. So I'm just going to show you a quick highlight reel here first, and then we'll be back. Welcome to Just Healing, where we rediscover humanity and our conversations around trauma and celebrate all the unique ways we love and heal. I'm one of your season two co-hosts, Michael Munson. Trauma doesn't exist in a bubble, and healing shouldn't either. Let's listen, let's learn, let's heal. So many of us were questioning, is there a place in the church for divorced Catholics, for women, for gays and lesbians? And um, of course, that did not sit well with my superiors when I started to question that. What I'm talking about when I say a cult is a high control group, a group that really forces you to bend to their rules. It's often very isolating. Um, there's generally a lot of manipulation. And in many cases, there can be abuse and different types of misconduct. Don't judge people. You don't know what they've been through. Especially people, if you're not from that culture, if you don't understand, but you see somebody dressed a certain way, talking a certain way, leaving their life a certain way. There's a reason why. There's always a reason why somebody behaves or does what they do. Be mindful of that. You had a criminal organization that was actually trafficking in young girls, in young black girls. When people decide that they're not going to come forward, this kind of behavior just perpetuates. Our individual attitudes and beliefs create those cultures, those systems, those laws and policies, which means we have the power to change them. We live in a society where men are taught to be stoic and rough and I'm not afraid of anything. And, you know, and so I think that that's an interesting nuance. We need to try as hard as it may be to shift that fear into a place of love. As humans, we have this innate right and need to know like where we end and where the world begins and trauma makes that so blurry for us or takes it away that was just a very few of the episodes we've got we've got almost 20 episodes just this season folks next want to want to share a uh piece from so one of our hosts at Matt just healing dr deborah Another men healing healing hero and champion has been around forever. And you want to talk about the ripple effect. Her son, her young preteen son, is now writing children's books about healing and conflict resolution. And his name is Lawrence Carey. He is an incredible young man. He's the new generation of healing. Let's put it that way. The new generation of healing advocates. And I want to share this clip of his newest book, Bill Fish finds a friend where he's going to read an excerpt from his newest book. So take it away, Lawrence. Hi, I'm Lawrence Carey, author of the Backwoods Builders and Chronicles series. And 
Today I'm going to be reading an excerpt from my most recent entry, Phil Fish Find a Friend. This book is the fourth in a series about managing different types of people in the workplace. But more importantly, in regard to this book, it's about old Phil Fish and Gary Gorilla overcoming their trauma in regards to each other as they've become somewhat prejudiced towards each other based off past experiences. Suddenly, Jumpin' Jim jumped out of the water and did a dolphin dance on his talented tail. Namaste, he said. May your hearts overflow with joy and peace. Not like the stream that overflowed and broke the bridge, but like a good overflow. You know what I mean. Jumpin' Jim, Billy Beaver blurted. Are we glad you're here? For we've got a contentious contingent of quarreling craftsmen who need to learn to meet in the middle. Can you help us? I live to serve, and I hope you don't mind. I brought a, a buddy, that fellow with the magnificent ears, who's, who's been following me around, is Jordan Jackrabbit. He's making a documentary about conflict resolution. Conflict resolution in, is just what we need, Billy. Beaver beamed brightly. Gary Gorilla and Phil Fish are feeling some friction. <clears throat> Problem with primates and means will be perfect for my picture. Jordan Jackrabbit jumped in. In times of crisis, the wise build bridges. So let's build a bridge. Jumping Jim joyously jabbered. Great. Where do we start? Beseeched Billy Beaver. Uh, I think this conundrum calls for a healing circle. Jumping Jim said. Where in the woods are we going to? Find one of those, Freddy Fox frowned. Maybe we you can, you can buy one at the BackwoodsBazaar.com. As a primal member, I get free neck day delivery, Clive Cooper commented. <laughs> a healing circle isn't something you buy, my feline friend. It's something you build by bringing people together in the spirit of love and joy. <laughs> Jumping Jim felt a shiver in his fins as he said the last part. In no time, Jim, Phil, and Gary were sitting in a circle on the shore of the stream. Before we can build this bridge, Jim began, you, we must bridge the gap between us. As for a long time, the swimmer and the silverback sat in silence staring at each other. Finally, Phil Fish was the first to speak. Let us do the stupid it, hmm. he said as he began fiercely flapping his fins. We'll never get along. Since we're just wasting our time. Phil Fi fragile fishy fuzz bucket flapping his fins, Gary grumbled. <laughs> Thankfully, they were interrupted by the chime of dawn. Now, gentlemen, Jim jumped in. Let's dig deeper. Why do you believe that you can never get along? I remember, as long as you get... Get your purchases from Amazon.com, 20% of the purchases from this book, and 100% of the profits from all Phil Fish Finds a Friend related merch go to Men Healing. So go on Amazon and get your book now. Because you did it with Mama. I don't know her. What? <laughs>
a pleasure of knowing for a very long time myself, Sandy Forty. She's going to She's going to come on here to talk about another really unique and necessary initiative that Men Healing has coming up very, very soon, the Home Project. This initiative is a significant expansion of our mission to reach more survivors and offer even more accessible healing opportunities to folks who otherwise wouldn't get it. So, Sandy, if you want to come on now and share a little bit more about the home project. All right, Lawrence, that's a hard act to follow. I must say I have to stop grinning so I can I can present to all of you uh, the home project. So as the clinical director of the home project, I have been asked to talk about it a little bit and talk about the why and the what of the home project. And as Jordan said earlier, this is about the accessibility of healing. Um, I'm going to start with the what. HOME, H-O-M-E, is an acronym that stands for Healing Outreach to Men Everywhere. We called it that because it is an invitation for incarcerated men to come home to themselves and to come home to a community of other men who are also healing from trauma. In its current form, HOME is a trauma-informed, interactive, compelling, and thanks to Jordan, a beautifully illustrated ebook that has been created to provide information about the impact of sexual harm on the emotions and behavior of men who are serving time. At its very inception, HOME is a prime example of the ripple effect of the Men Healing Organization. In brief, here is the story. Three years ago, an alumnus from Ohio who attended the very first weekend of recovery in 2001 and then several um, weekends of recovery beyond that, approached men healing about the fact that closed computer tablets were being introduced to prison populations all over the country. This is not something we were aware of. He had spent considerable time over the previous year knocking on doors of the Ohio uh, Department of Corrections uh, and finally had succeeded in getting information about NA and, and AA onto those tablets. He approached us about doing the same for um, the impact of sexual harm. Uh, we quickly discovered after he brought this to us that the estimated number of incarcerated men who have survived sexual assault is 56%. The reality is that that's probably much higher. Just think about that for a moment. Of the several million um, men in this country who incarcerated, anywhere between 56 and 80% of those men have a sexual harm history. Um, since men healing um, has a commitment that no, there shouldn't be any barriers to healing, um, we decided that we were gonna take this project on. As we suddenly became aware that, that we were, that there was a population of men who'd been sexually harmed and were reactive to that sexually harm that we were not reaching. So, so we decided to gather the rich abundance of what we know about the impact of sexual harm on boys and men. And we created accessible materials to convey not only that information, but we've also provided techniques for gaining awareness about and management of emotional triggers and somatic reactions. Think about that for a moment, being inside, being behind bars and having actual tools um, to manage uh, emotions and, and uh, somatic reactions. Again, back to the ripple effect, because of the collaborative effects of, of efforts of men healing over the years with other organizations, such as the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center, the Center for Justice Innovation in New York, and the rich resources that our alumni bring, we are also able, we were able to gather a committee of people with direct experience working with correctional institutions and with survivors, both, to begin to develop material specific to this population. Working with a largely volunteer team of people from every facet of men healing, including our executive director, Jim Struby, members of our clinical team, our somatic educator, a member of our board and alumni with all kinds of crazy skills from AI to yoga to videography, and with the enthusiastic support of our connections at the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation Connection and Corrections, we got to work. It has been a very exciting and at times challenging collaborative effort. Our ebook will be free to any incarcerated individual who opens it. And once it is downloaded, 
it will go on to the tablets of over 800,000 incarcerated folks living behind bars. At the end of the year, that number may reach closer to a million. So why the home project? The home project, we believe in the power of knowledge. We believe in the power of community. We believe that healing is possible. We believe that the limitations of one's environment should not be a barrier to psychological and emotional healing. What is the ripple effect that brought us here? The project idea was the brainchild of an alumnus who had been connected to us for 23 years. The project has been a collaborative effort from many of our connections over the years. What is the ripple effect going forward? 800,000 men, are you kidding me? Incarcerated men who are survivors will be directing friends and family to the ebook and, and educating so many more people. Incarcerated individuals can potentially support groups of survivors on the inside. We already have an example of that. The increase in awareness of the prevalence and impact of childhood sexual abuse may lead to greater protection for the children of returning survivors. Overall, we might need to change the name of this event to the tsunami effect. Mm -hmm. So please understand that, that the project, like I said, is largely volunteer going forward. We are gonna add chapters to that book. We're going to add more interactive ability. We're gonna make that available in print form to, um, to online um, uh, and so that that book can be purchased. And we'll have an iteration of it that's available to mental health organizations and rape crisis centers. We're very excited about this and um, it has been an absolute joy to be working on this. Okay, thank you. No other organization is doing things like this, and this is why we need your support. Thank you, Sandy. I'm really honored to be a part of Home and illustrating the uh, ebook for everyone to see across the freaking nation. I do want to take a moment um, to share something a, a, a wee bit personal. Uh, I am a survivor of childhood sexual trauma myself and human trafficking, so I I understand on a deeply personal level just how important support is during someone's healing journey. When you're dealing with trauma, especially trauma like sexual abuse and, and things like that, it is so isolating. It's like you're trapped in your pain with no way out, nowhere to break free. The shame, the silence, the weight of the weight of it all, it's truly overwhelming. When I first started searching for some help for myself when I was a young man, there was absolutely nothing. Um, I reached out to rape crisis centers. I reached out to women's organizations. I went to the uh, my school's uh, helpline, and there was just no, there was nobody who could. It's not like they didn't want to help. They were just had no resources for me. There was nowhere to send me, and so I truly, it kind of instilled this idea that I already had within myself that I was an anomaly, that this doesn't happen to people, and that I can't, I didn't have anywhere to go. I really, truly felt like I was one in a million, like nobody would actually understand. Then I came across Men Healing, and I would have never been able to afford a weekend of recovery back then. I could have never afforded any sort of treatment back in those early days. But the folks at Men Healing wouldn't let that be a barrier for me to get help. And because of the financial assistance I received from Men Healing to attend one of their weekends of recovery, I was able to go. And it changed my life quite profoundly. I suddenly felt like I wasn't one in a million. I was part of this community, a community of people who cared and wanted me to heal, not just watch me heal, but heal alongside me. And that was almost 20 years ago. And because of generous donors and folks that truly cared, I was able to get that financial assistance and which allowed me to go to that retreat. So donors like you, saved my life quite literally. I was given that space to heal. And spaces like Men Healing, where survivors can come together and feel seen, heard, and understood. For me and for so many others, it's been just that. The, Men Healing is more than just an organization. It's a family. It's a lifeline. 
a place where we can reclaim our identities and move past all the pain of our past and begin to write new stories for ourselves and for our lives. It's a place where we learn that we are not defined by what happened to us or what was done to us, as Rob said earlier, um, but how we choose to heal and grow from that. This kind of work, this kind of transformative type of healing, it doesn't happen in isolation. It requires a community, a community of support and a community of resources. And it takes an entire network of people willing to stand behind us, behind all the survivors, offering not only their empathy and their understanding, but their financial support. And without that, none of this is possible. This is why I'm asking tonight if you guys can help us continue this truly crucial and important work that we do here. This work changes people's lives like it did mine. And we can only continue this type of work with the generosity of folks like you. So if you are able, I'm inviting you to contribute right now. All of this goes directly to the work that we do. This is not, our staff is like five people where this is not going to overhead, <laughs> overhead costs. This is going to the survivors who need it. This is going to uh, the home project. This is going to support groups. This is truly going where it needs to go. You know, we're not, we're really not trying to build this empire of, uh, of men healing. We're truly building a movement and we're, we want to invite you guys to be on that ride with us. We're going no matter what. So come with us and from the bottom of my heart. Truly. I've been working, I've been with men healing, like I said, for almost 20 years, I've been working professionally with them for the last seven and it's a full circle moment for me. I started at their weekends of recovery when I was 20. Two, I think. And now I'm the creative director of the organization and I'm 40. So it's truly a full circle moment for me. And it, it really means a lot. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. <clears throat> thank you all for being here. Thank you for being part of this community and for choosing to make that ripple yourself in whatever shape, way or form that you can. Before we close out the rest of the evening, we do have one more uh, performance for you. This is a special guest. His name is Kieran Riley. Um, he messaged me and found some of the work that Men Healing had done and reached out to me on Facebook. And we made a connection and we become friends. And he's a singer songwriter. And I asked him if he could contribute one of his songs to this event tonight. And he gladly agreed. And then we've worked together over the last month to put together uh, a little music video of, of one of his songs. It's really powerful. It's meaningful. You might want to grab a box of Kleenex beside you while he sings, but I want to introduce Kieran Riley. Hi, everybody at Men Healing. Um, thank you for tuning in to the fundraiser today. I'm sorry that I can't be there as it's happening, but as you can maybe tell from my accent, I'm in England, so I'll likely be fast asleep by now, um, hopefully. Um, yeah, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about me and a little bit about the song that you're going to hear. I'm a singer songwriter from England. I wrote a lot of songs when I was part of Pentecostal Church in England for quite a few years and so a lot of my songs kind of reflected that. But then as I started to experience questions surrounding the trauma that I'd experienced as a child, I started to write songs more about that trauma and through that revelation of what actually did happen as a child. This song in particular is called Who I Choose To Be and it's all about really moving on from that person that affected me so much by kind of reclaiming my life. And I don't really want to say too much about how I wrote it really because it kind of just fell out of my heart and my mind and I really hope that it ministers to people who have been through similar things. Also, I hope for the people who may have family or friends who have been impacted by sexual trauma. I just really hope that you like the song. Thank you for having me. And thank you so much for supporting Men Healing. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Was the last time that I let 
let you in And it's fine If I never see your face again I'm done Dying for a liar's sin Because of you I'm not who I might have Take me out No, you won't break me down It's no secret anymore The wall that you built up for me Is crashing down, crashing down on you You can't harm me anymore You're just a faded, broken memory what you made of me is not who I choose to be, not who I choose to be. Does it hurt to see me with these broken chains? Free from the shackles of your wicked hands, did you know? My life was like a battlefield Well now, freedom's won me back my heart Oh, you won't take me out No, you won't break me down It's no secret anymore The wall that you build up for me Crashing down, crashing down on you You can't harm me anymore You're just a faded, broken memory What you made of me is not who I choose to be Not who I choose to be Don't you think I've had enough of you Messing with my head You've already stole the best of me Don't you know that I I've had enough of seeing you Everywhere I go You're trying to take the rest of me It's no secret anymore That wall that you built up for me Is crashing down Anymore. The wall that you built up for me Crashing down, crashing down on you You can't harm me anymore You're just a faded, broken memory What you made of me is not who I choose to be Not who I choose to be Thank you, Kieran. Such a lovely song. And he truly believes in the work that Men Healing is doing. And he keeps telling me he's so excited to get more involved. So thank you, Kieran, from across the pond. I'd like to invite another one of Men Healing's supporters and alumni, Rob Berger, to talk about a donation that he's going to make. Hello, everyone. I'm Rob, and uh, I'm both a survivor and a proud alumni of Men Healing. I have benefited greatly both from uh, several different weekends of recovery and the uh, peer support groups. I got to tell you, I'm truly deeply grateful for the men healing community and the safe space for my recovery that men healing has created. Part of my recent healing journey involved creating a comic book style painting and exhibiting it at a nonprofit art gallery in my neighborhood. You can see my handiwork here behind me. <clears throat> uh, I don't have to tell you, uh, most of the other artwork on display was either abstract or beautiful. And then there was my painting, right? Telling my abuse story. When it sold for $500, no one was more surprised than myself, but I immediately knew what I wanted to do with the money. I'm donating that $500 to Men Healing, 
and I hope you'll consider making your own donation. I know our donations will help someone else heal. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. We so appreciate that donation. Thank you so much. My wife and I have decided as part of this event to um, donate $1,000. And um, we um, believe in all of the work that Men Healing is doing and will do in the future. So um, to the campaign, great job, staff. And uh, my wife, Nancy, and I are very happy to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. We really, really, really appreciate you all for coming and becoming, being a part of this movement that Men Healing is on the fast track on. You know, we have been doing this for a long time. We've evolved, we've changed, and we really believe that we are doing some incredible, incredible work. A lot of you here have either benefited from it or been a part of this movement yourselves, and we appreciate every second that you all have been here. We want to thank everybody for coming for sticking around, for enjoying all the performances. For We want to thank all of the people at Men Healing, the staff. I want to thank Zadia and Sam and Jim and Sandy and Rob and other Rob and everybody for being a part of this. It really means a lot to us that you're here and that you've contributed. I would encourage everybody to check out all the links, check out the podcast, go to our website, sign up for the newsletter. You can stay, stay abreast of all of the stuff that we've got going on at Men Healing. Just sign up for the newsletter, stay in touch with us, follow us on social media, stay in touch with us in whatever way that feels most comfortable for you. Um, tell your family, your friends, your colleagues, if you work in the trauma or healing fields, let them know that we're here because we do, you know, we're, we're small and mighty and, and we need word of mouth to get us out there. So keep building the movement with us. Just again, thanks for everyone being a drop of water and making a difference because we are more than a river. We are on the way to creating a dynamic movement. So thanks for everyone who's been here tonight. And if you guys ever want to learn more, please reach out to any of them, me, Men Healing, Jim, any of us. You can reach out to any of us. We are a small and mighty community and we will always answer you back. So thank you for being here. Thank you for contributing. Thank you for being a part of this movement. And um, we'll look forward to hopefully seeing you again. Mm -hmm.